Well, good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to our weekly service here at Dornach Free Church. It's wonderful to be able to gather in this way and to worship our God. Let's begin this morning by hearing him speak to us through his word, reminding us of his greatness and of the fact that he is in control over all things, as we're going to be looking at this morning. In Psalm 29 we read, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name, worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful, the voice of the Lord is full of majesty, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as King forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord, we thank you that you are great and good. We thank you that you are gracious. We thank you that you are generous in your dealings with us. We thank you that your word tells us that you are holy and just and true. We recognise that God is spirit who is infinite, eternal and unchangeable in his being. We thank you that in the passion of Jesus Christ you have come to us and revealed yourself to us as the one who is full of mercy and of grace, whilst at the same time having a right to judge your people. We thank you that you're the God whom we have come to know and the God who wills that others come to know him as well. We thank you for so much this morning and we pray that you would forgive us for being ungrateful so often and for failing to return thanks to your great name. So we come with our praise and we also come with our petitions and we ask Lord that you would draw near today to all who are struggling, to all who are suffering, to all who sorrow. We remember before you the many families who have lost loved ones in these days, not just to the coronavirus, but through other illnesses as well, and the incidents taking place that have caused men and women, young and old, to be suddenly removed from time into eternity. We commit all grieving families to you, and we pray for all who seek to minister to them in your name. We thank you for the services of many whose services we all too often take for granted. We remember the undertakers at this time with their workload being heavier than normal and we ask that you would help them to be sensitive to the needs of the various families whom they must care for and serve. We bring before you the situation in general and we we commit all who are in positions of authority to you and those who are seeking to find a vaccine. We thank you, Lord, that even over these past days we've heard news of an antibody having been found that may very well go some way to alleviating the situation. But we do ask that it would not be long until a cure is found, should that be your gracious will. We remember before you all who are involved in caring, the nurses and the caring people who in different ways minister to so many different individuals in their time of need. We thank you for them all and we remember locally here, our own care homes, we pray for oversteps in the meadows, we pray for Innesmore and for the Seaforth House and we thank you of the work done through Highland Croft Home Care and we thank you for all these ministries. Remember all families, especially those who are vulnerable at this time. Bless those who seek to help through food banks and other means. We commit all charities to you who seek to alleviate the needs of others. And we thank you for all who show the love and care and concern in these different ways. This morning we commit the work of the Christian Church to you and ask that you would help us as we seek to adjust to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you and to your word. And we thank you for those who tune in to these services. 
praying that those of them who don't know Jesus would come to know him. We remember the General Assembly of our own church and other churches at this time, and we know, Lord, that we're unable to meet physically, but we do commit the work to you in all its aspects and ask that you would give wisdom to those who are in positions of leadership within the church. Remember today that those whose livelihoods are at stake as a result of this virus and grant that you would give them all to commit themselves to you and to know that you care for them. There are so many that we ought to bring before you and we name them now in our hearts that before the throne of grace we cast our cares upon you we seek to bear one another's burdens and in so doing fulfil the law of Christ. Hear us and forgive us and accept us in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. it's good to have you with us again this morning. I don't know if any of you have ever been abroad and if you have I don't know if any of you have been in a country called Switzerland but in Switzerland eh, near a well-known town called Lucerne there is a little town called Altdorf and in the square at Altdorf there's a statue to somebody that you've probably heard about a man by the name of William Tell William Tell refused to recognise the foreign tyrant, I think he was from Austria, who had conquered the part of Switzerland where he lived. William Tell was arrested and he was told that he would only be released if he shot an apple on the head of his little son who had been arrested with him. The apple was placed on the boy's head. William Tell took aim. The arrow flew from the bow 
It split the apple in two and didn't even graze the boy's head. Now, I think that's a great story. Uh, but I think that it's also true to say that the hero of the story isn't just William Tell, but his little boy who trusted him. And you know that in the Bible, uh, we're told that we have a father in heaven, if we're trusting in Jesus, whom we can trust at all times and in all situations. The Bible tells us that God is more dependable than any father and the Bible tells us that he is worthy of us putting our faith in him so that no matter what's happening around us he is worthy of us coming to him and casting all our cares upon him. I don't know what problems you have in your life. You may have little problems or you may have great big problems but there is a God whom you can trust. That little boy obviously trusted his father and sets us an example as to what we should do if we know God as our heavenly father. The Bible tells us of what God has done in order that he might become our father in heaven. He has sent his son Jesus into the world to die for our sins and if we trust in him then we truly can call God Father and we can trust him at all times and in all things. We can trust him just now when the coronavirus epidemic is something that we're all aware of. We don't need to be afraid if we're trusting in God. So just as that wee boy trusted in his dad, let us mature that we are trusting in God as our heavenly dad. Thank you once again for listening and God be with you until we meet again. held the oceans in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to
Well, let's read God's word this morning in Psalm 33. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him. Because we trust in his holy name, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. I'd like to look with you just for a short while this morning at this psalm, a psalm that speaks to us of God's sovereignty and of how that should make his people respond with thanksgiving and with praise. It's a psalm that tells us that God is in control and that therefore we can have complete confidence in him. There are several points the psalmist makes that I just want to hone in on for a few moments today. In the opening three verses he speaks of our worship of God. He says we're to shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Now that means that before we can truly shout for joy we must be in the Lord we must be right with him. So let's ask ourselves at the very outset, are we in the Lord? Are we right with God through faith in Christ? Well, if we are, we're told that in our worship, praise is fitting. Praise is something that is appropriate. Praise is something that God looks for and that we ought to be more than willing to give to him. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre, make melody to him, with a harp of ten strings, the psalmist says. The attitude of gratitude, thanksgiving to the Lord, must always be there. 
in the Old Testament worship, they used the lyre and the harp of ten strings and many other instruments besides as they praised the Lord. Now, and we're being asked to use all the gifts and talents God has blessed us with to praise his holy name as we worship him. But fundamentally, our worship must be in spirit and in truth. It must be coming from hearts and minds that have been renewed by the grace of God. And that's why he says, sing to him a new song, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. The only people who can sing a new song are those who are new creatures in Christ Jesus. So as we come together today, let us make sure that we are worshipping him as those who are new men and women in Christ. Now, as those who sing a song that speaks to us, that speaks of what he has done for us and that glorifies his great name. Our worship must be in spirit and our worship must be in truth. That is what matters more than anything else. So can I ask, what's your worship like this morning? Are you merely concerned about the form or are you concerned that your worship be real, that it come from the heart? Well, if you know God, then he expects you and me to worship him in a way that is honouring to him. And then he goes on in verses 4 to 9 to speak of God's word to us. He speaks here of the Lord's word as being upright and all his work being done in faithfulness. We can trust in God's word because he is faithful, whose word it is. We so often find ourselves disappointed by putting our trust in words spoken by men who do not, at the end of the day, prove themselves to be faithful. And we ourselves may often be guilty of failing when it comes to faithfulness. But the word of the Lord is upright and all that he says and all that he does is done in faithfulness. And therefore we can have confidence in him and rejoice in who he is and in the fact that we can rely wholeheartedly on what he says to us. We can also rejoice in that he loves righteousness and justice and that the earth is full of his steadfast love. Here we're being told that in the midst of all the injustices of which we may be aware of in our world, that there is one who loves righteousness and justice. And we can have complete confidence that the judge of all the earth will do what is right. Therefore, we can come to him and we can give thanks today that he is in charge. We live in a world where we're conscious of so much hatred and of so much that is wrong. But here we're told that the whole earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. The Lord's love never fails. And the fact that his gospel is to be preached throughout the whole world is proof positive of his love for our lost mankind. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. So can I ask, are you today trusting in Jesus as the one who came not to condemn, but to save the world? By the word of the Lord we're told the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, he puts the deep in storehouses. This again is speaking to us of the Lord's powerful word, the word that brought the whole universe into existence. The Lord who is at all times in control, no matter how things may appear to us. He is the one who wants us to realise that we as the inhabitants of the world ought to stand, as it says here, in awe of him. Let all the earth fear him. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. I remember being over in the States uh, on more than one occasion and one phrase that you often hear our brothers and sisters uh, over there use is the phrase awesome. So many things are awesome. But the Bible tells us that ultimately only God is truly awesome. And here we've been told in his word to us that all the earth ought to stand in awe of the Lord. 
So do you stand in awe of him today? And do you rejoice in the revelation that he's given of himself to you in his word? So we're to rejoice in our worship of God. We're to rejoice in his word to us. And we're also to rejoice in his will for us. Because in verses 10 to 12 we're told that the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. God's purposes are being fulfilled. Even in these perplexing times. When there's so many things seem to be topsy-turvy and the whole world seems to be upside down. We're being told here that the counsel of the nations, the plans, the schemes of, of men and women are brought to nothing by the Lord. That are frustrated by the Lord whilst his plans, his purposes endure forever. There is nothing that can thwart the Lord from fulfilling his purposes. And how marvellous that ought to be to us, in particular, in terms of spiritual matters and salvation issues. Because God's word tells us that his purpose in coming into the world was to save us and not to condemn us. The reason for Jesus' coming was not so that the world might go to hell, but so that men and women, boys and girls from all over the world might go to heaven. God's sovereign purposes are fulfilled in all that is going on around us. But God's sovereign purposes are fulfilled supremely in the finished work of his Son, Jesus Christ. And here we've been told that those who are the Lord's, those whom he brings to himself as his chosen people, are blessed indeed. So can I ask today, do you have reason to believe and to rejoice in the salvation of God and in what has been done for you in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should repent and believe the gospel. And so we're to be grateful to God today that he is sovereign in all things. He is sovereign over all that is going on at this time as at all times. Nothing happens out with his knowledge. Nothing happens out with his permissive will. Rejoice today as you worship God. Rejoice today as you read and reflect on his word to you. Reflect and rejoice today in God's will for us as revealed in his word. But there are two other things that the psalmist brings before us as well that ought to make us praise his name. In verses 13 to 19, we're being told that the Lord watches over us. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of men. He sees you. He sees me. He sees us where we are. He sees what we're like. There is nothing about us that he does not see, that he doesn't know. He watches from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The Lord knows all about us. He knows where we are. He knows what we're doing. He even knows our very thoughts. There is nothing that we can hide from him. How does that strike you today? It may be that that thought fills you with fear because you know that there are many things in your life as there are in mine that ought not to be. But how thankful we should be that we can go to the Lord and ask him who sees all things to take away from us not only the things that we're aware of that are wrong but even our secret faults that he might make us new creatures in Christ Jesus. The Christ Jesus who came into the world in order that our sins might be forgiven and in order that we might have removed from our lives everything that is offensive in his sight. He watches over us. He knows everything there is to know about us. When you go to hospital for an x-ray, things are often shown up there. 
that you might not even have known about yourself. And when you come to scripture, it's like God putting his x-ray on you and God showing you your need spiritually in order that you might realise that the God who shows you your need is the God who has done something to deal with that need. He's the one who has come in Jesus to remove from your life and from mine all that is offensive to him and all that is, spiritually speaking, of deadly danger as far as we ourselves are concerned. But we ought to rejoice too in this, that he watches over his people now, as those who know him as their heavenly Father. We're told that he observes all the deeds of men. We're told that the king is not saved by his great army or a warrior by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation and by its great might cannot rescue. But the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who look to him for salvation. If you're looking to him for salvation today, then he's watching over you as a father watches over his child. He's watching over you in love. He's watching over you as one who cares for you. He's watching over you as those who are hoping in his steadfast love. This phrase, steadfast love, is one that we find again and again in the Bible. We saw it last week in our look at Psalm 13, and God willing, we're going to look at it even more fully next week when we come to Psalm 36. But today, what a wonderful privilege it is for us to know that the Lord watches over us even more closely and more lovingly than we could ever watch over any of our children. And if we are truly hoping or trusting in his unfailing, unchanging love, we can be sure that we need not be afraid of anything that may come our way, either now or in the future. We have nothing to worry about spiritually, because we're told that he watches over us in order that he might deliver our souls from death. And if we're trusting in Christ, then there's a very real sense in which he's already done this for us. Paul speaks of the one who has delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver. And neither need we be afraid of anything that may come our way in providence, because we're told that he will keep them alive in famine. At this time, we're living in the days of great uncertainty, and none of us are immune. Any of us might be struck down at any time with this virus or with any of the other illness and ailments common to men. But what a wonderful thing to know that no matter what may happen to us, that God will watch over us and that spiritually we have been born of him and will never die. So that even though we die, yet we will live. God watches over us. God wants nothing but the best for each and every one of us. How we ought to rejoice then in our worship of God. How we ought to rejoice because of God's word to us. How we ought to rejoice in his will for us. How we ought to rejoice in his watching over us. And finally, how we ought to rejoice as we wait upon him. We're told that our soul must wait for the Lord. Our soul waits for the Lord the psalmist says, he is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, there it is again, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Are you today waiting on the Lord? Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Are you trusting in the Lord? Are you putting your complete confidence in him? Even more than they that wait for morning, are you waiting for the Lord? Can you say that he is your help and your shield? Can you say that your heart is glad in him? Who can say these things? Only those who are trusting in his holy name. It is only those who are putting their confidence in him who can possibly say such words. So as we draw to a close today, can I ask, where does this leave you? Perhaps you're not yet at the stage 
where you're able to say for sure that you're trusting in the Lord. He's asking you today to come to him just as you are and to put your trust in him. My soul waits for the Lord. If that is you today, then come to him right now and ask him to take you to himself and to help you to cast all your cares upon him. The hymn writer said this, and may you say it as well, from your heart, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. May each one of us be able to say these words from the heart and rejoice this morning as we know that he is the Lord who is in complete control of all that is going on around us and that he is the Lord who is in complete control of our own lives and destinies. Lord, bless these thoughts on your word to us and grant that we would have complete confidence in you so as to rejoice in who you are and in all that you've done for us. And until we meet again in your will, grant that grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, might be with us all, now and indeed forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.